Well, good afternoon. I hope you don't sleep. You had coffee. You know. I was worried that I would be talking in the afternoon and everybody would sleep. You know. But I see everybody awake. Well, I will start with Sopros, you know, why it was established, you know. I was working in the bank, not 25 years, but 28 years, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, making money, I had a lot of, a lot of, it was a government bank, support of Asian bank, IFAR, you know. And we had done a lot of mistakes, you know, as he was telling, you know. Usually you have, you give money, you have no idea, and they can make it, you know. Microcredit, microfinance. But we also had a program called a small farm development program, uh, you know, within the bank, which was very innovative, where we will focus on, on poor farmers, where we provide not only money, but also provide technology and building organization. This was initially supported by IFA, and later on, Asian Bank also came in. But later on, the bank said, well, we will only talk about credit, you can't talk about non-banking sort of mobilization and, uh, and, and technology. So I got fed up and said, oh, okay, you do a job now, I, I do things differently. And some of us left the bank and we started with the NGO. And the reason was, you know, for NGO, you also need a political space to operate. You cannot operate in an autocratic, uh, you know, monarchical regime that we had for 30 years, where they would not allow any civic societal institution to operate on the ground. Because you cannot mobilize the poor against the state. So we had to really look for kind of opportunity which came after the 1990 revolution that we had, which turned monarchy into constitutional monarchy. And uh, there was open space for institutions to come uh, and compete with the government also. So we use that space now. We start with, from a small project in Gorkha, you know, in, which is in the, in the West, you know. I'll, I'll go to the map later on with the GDJ financing, doing you know building bridges, uh, supporting community community infrastructure like water supply, irrigation, community forestry, uh, all done through through community groups. We provided technical support, and that that we call it action research project <coughs> on poverty elevation. We didn't know as our friend was in that we we said point blank. Whatever we learn in banking, we leave that and we learn. In fact, in that time, I spent 10 days going to the Chepan, which are the tribals, with my sleeping bag, talking to them, understanding their problems. And it was varied. In one village you go, you find a different kind of problem. And I still remember that time we had a water supply system we promoted, but we ignored sanitation. And I remember in one village, we had three deaths because of lack of sanitation, hand washing, or latrines. So that, that there we had to talk in terms of a holistic approach. And then we, we prepared a kind of approach, which is called holistic, a model for poverty reason approach, which doesn't concentrate on, on credit alone, or infrastructure, or, or institution, a combination of organizing development and capacity of the people, not, not of the NGO, infrastructure, that they, they demand, you know, we, I'll, I'll go later on in terms of what are the infrastructure, resource generation mobilization. A lot, lot of places when you go, there are a lot of resource within the community, but you feel that these guys are poor, you give them, them some money. What we, we learned in a lot of places, they, they, they had what we call, we did some kind of participatory action research in terms of participatory planning. And we found out that a lot of surplus leakage like people who drink a lot, poor health, smoke, and you know, a lot of going on consumption and then no savings. So if you control that, you can increase savings in that first part. The other part which is also important was water. What you have to identify the potential in terms of what can be done. Whether it is vegetables or horticulture or livestock or what have you in that area and then increase income, increase savings. You create your own institution like property and then do the lending. Not in terms of pushing the money and creating institutions. So that is the reason we call resource mobilized generation mobilization and income generation of course in terms of livelihood you know, <coughs> uh, activities which, which I will come later. Environmental sustenance we, we, we try to, to talk in terms of 
uh, uh, you know, renewable energy, community forestry, biogas, micro hydro, and uh, even 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 promoting latrines, which was very important. Now, now you you talk in terms of improved sanitation, even for export of agriculture, you need improved sanitation. You have standards. Uh, now, major activities. I already told you this institution level is one, which is the core. Unless you build institution of the poor, and unless you really mobilize and organize the poor, uh, you, you cannot create development. It's their development which is important, not ours. Really. And uh, that is the core element of this whole process. And then uh, we emphasize on productive factor in terms of water and energy. Water, uh, I will come later. Water, which is huge in our case for water supply, irrigation, and micro basically in terms of generating power, you know, related energy. Rural access impro improvement, we've done a lot, uh, mobilizing the community in terms of building green roads, uh, bridges, substantial bridges. Uh, lately, recently, uh, these gravity ropeways for transporting vegetables from uh, the top of the mountain to the, uh, to the, to the, to the roads, which is very effective uh, when time saving. Uh, and you know, I, I am trying to use here you know, the element. You know, we, we are also working with WFE in terms of uh, distributing food. But when we are talking to the people, they said we don't want your food. We want food to be used as input in terms of creating assets, community assets. So we use food as a sort of input in building infrastructure, like irrigation, particularly improving access. A lot of cases we also use. Uh, food as an element for paying wages to build a school. You know. So that way food has become not a distribution element but in terms of creating wealth in, in, the, in the community, which is quite a large problem. And now we're talking in terms of not short-term food security but long-term food security, where can poor can produce their own, own food and also sell. Now in terms of area, I, I think I can operate no? with this one. Yes, this one. Yeah. yeah, this one. You know, in fact, we, we were from already here. We were not too from here, you know, in the central area. Then we moved to this whole area, you know, this Midwestern park. And this area, this, we are in Badan, Badura, Mugu. This is the one which has got the lowest yet there. You know, when you compare between Kathmandu and Mugu, Kathmandu is 72 between two years of life expectancy. Mugu is 39. You have that kind of stark difference. And Mugu is accessible only by, by plane. But Mugu has got a great Himalaya, Rara Lake, and beautiful, you know, beautiful in terms of tourist potential. And also a lot of potential for organic agriculture because you cannot take fertilizer and uh, it's organic by default. And we are promoting a lot of greenhouse in that area. And, uh, you know, as, as he said, the highest poverty is in this region. And that is the reason where we are Maoist insurgency started from there. We have 10 years of Maoist insurgency and uh, 15,000 people got killed. And we have got now peace in terms of negotiation for the last four years. And the day I came here, we had this constituent assembly, which is supposed to, you know, we the constitution and they were negotiating till midnight. Now they have extended for three months to get the new constitution with a lot of pressure in terms of because governance is also important because we are in in, in, in terms of transition and we have a lot of political instability because of the lack of lack of you know the legal structure in terms of constitution which we are in the process of doing it. But it is a very painful exercise in terms of deep negotiation. You have radical masses, you have liberal democrats, you have regional parties, everybody getting together and getting to some kind of conclusion is, is, is becoming more difficult. Now, in terms of objective, I think I've, I've said, you know, building, uh, governing, self governing type of institutions which, which will set their own rules, set their own agenda and, and, and do development. We don't impose the agenda, but they, they will set their own rules. Now, in terms of uh, community infrastructure and 
Yeah, this is also important. Community managed natural resource system. I want to explain what is the situation in Nepal. We have uh, around 3.1 million hectares of community forest here in Nepal. Potential community forest. Out of that, I think 1.2 million, 25 percent, uh, is managed by the community. Around 14,000 uh, community groups. And you know, you in the, the reason I'm trying to explain to you, we had community tradition in the past also, but you also need a legal backup to to get a legitimate message to the system, so that you have a defined use right in terms of the communities, you know, uh, taking benefit and also contributing. And in 1993, after the democracy, we had a community uh, forestry user group act. In 1995, we had this regulation which allowed the right of the community to manage. Uh, and that, that way, there was a big transfer of the user right from, uh, from government to the, to the community in terms of community forestry management. But we still have problems in terms of resistance to the bureaucracy, that they would not like user right to be transferred. And then the, we have also problems in the South, particularly in terms of what they call joint forest management, wherein in the management you bring government and also community, that doesn't seem to work, you know. Because who, who in how do you share the benefit? How do you manage? Who is going to control, you know? And now there is a big fight. You know, after the community forestry becomes successful in terms of producing more water, producing more timber, and uh, the government started, you know, looking into the community forestry as a revenue source. And they are saying that give us 40% of the, of the revenue, you know, to us. And there is a big fight between the Federation of Community Forestry, which is a national federation, and the government in terms of not having that kind of rigid, you know, the regulation which would take out the revenue from the community. And now, you know, another objective is in terms of uh, achieving sustainable household income and food security. We used to, usually we ignore food security. And in Nepal, you have what, uh, you have what, uh, you know, 48 percent nutrition problem with the children, very high malnutrition problem. And around 19 percent, you know, of uh, adults are uh, malnourished, you know. So, so now increasingly there is more, more focus put on food security and nutrition. So that you emphasize a lot on on producing homegrown food and and then uh, selling surplus to the market. So that that is the reason we put food security and nutrition and enhancing participation of women. And this is very important because we have to now take into consideration equity to bring more inclusiveness. And also the other reason there is also vested interest. You know, now we don't have any opportunity in Nepal. Limited opportunity. So we have more migration of people going out, and it's the, mostly the boys and men go out. So you have more women. So women naturally would, would participate in these organizations. So you have, we are also emphasizing a lot on women-friendly technology, like water supply, which would reduce water burden of women, and also energy, you know, cooking stoves, biogas, microhydro, which would reduce time spent in, in, in cooking food or or agro processing, you know. So that is the reason we, our interventions are related to women. Now, yes, physical and financial, I, I, I talked about financial resource base. I think one of the important things somebody told in the morning is that we have to really, you know, what I've seen in the, in the map you saw, is starting from the east to the west. You know, we have more precipitation level, rainfall in the east, and you have less in the far west. Those areas where you have more rainfall are richer. And, you know, the far west has got less rainfall, are poorer, you know. So, you know, and if you have got more rain, you have better forest, you have, you know, better energy sources and all this. Uh, and uh, so we, we try to assess in terms of physical resource base of the community and, and, and develop the sort of interventions accordingly. Uh, local capacity to manage and sustain. A lot of times we give some input, but you don't really talk in terms of sustainability, both in terms of institution, also in terms of the technology. And one could give some some kind of larger dam 
if people are not involved in terms of building or they don't know the technology, they cannot. A lot of times we have what, you know, I, I will show you a study which we have done in 2001. And in a lot of government projects, I we found that we said, government will build an irrigation system or a water supply system and hand it over. And what we said in this study report uh, that uh, uh, you are handing over a stupid duty to the to the people. You build a large water supply system. You have, they can't manage, and then you say that people cannot manage the system uh, because they have no capability because the system was more 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 complicated. So there, the design of the project, the involvement of people from the starting from the planning stage to the implementation is important for sustainability. Improving the quality of life through social intervention. This is important. I mean, you, you, you cannot talk in terms of growth. I mean, you were telling in terms of, you, you, you talk in terms of improving quality of life. And there the intervention in terms of health, in terms of schooling, in terms of water supply becomes very important. So we, we, we packet together uh, those, those components also in addition to production infrastructure. Now, you know, based upon this, we develop a model on social mobilization based on the experience in the field. This is one of the group meetings, and you can see the kind of people who have the, the, the poorest in the in Bajra district, which is the second poorest after movement. And this is one of the group meetings. Uh, now, in, ta in terms of the targeting mechanism, we have got settlement targeting and household targeting. Because settlement in terms of, you know, food insecurity, ethnicity, level of income, family size, natural resource. You know, those areas which have got more food insecurity, more uh, Dalit population or Indian population, or lower level of income, or you know, poor natural resource would be poorer in, in terms of village. And then you go into in terms of household level where you use another indicators in the food insecurity, assets, income, family size. If you have less land and you have larger than you are poor. And level of independentness, you know. I mean, if you are indebted to a large extent, you are poor. Because you are financing from borrowings in terms of survival. Uh, yeah, program of strategy, you know. The reason I'm, uh, I I might go maybe spend two, three minutes here is because, you know, when I was starting this NGO, after I think, Three, four years, I went to Andhra Pradesh, Maksalite area, as a consultant from E5. And, you know, I, I was uh, with, the, with the police with guns and all this, and I remember I was going with the collector in one of the interviewing departments, AK-47, you know. I said, why do you need AK-47 for your protection? I said, look, Mr. Collector, you know, they might shoot you and I also get shot, so I don't want you. Next day you don't come, you know. I will go alone, you know. And I said, how are you really delivering in such a critical condition in Andhra Pradesh, India? I want to understand you. I'm also doing the same kind of work in Nepal. And we didn't have Maoists that time. He said, you try to use local people. You train them as mobilizers. And if you do that properly, they will negotiate compared to the Babus that you send for the NGO government. So that is one of the reasons we started changing our strategy and getting local youth, women, women, as social mobilizers and train them in terms of how to mobilize them. In fact, our mobilization package was more based on video and pictures. And a lot of Maoist workers also came to our open meeting. You know, uh, how do you mobilize? Because we used to use a concept for contradiction tree, where we try to analyze, you know, reach poor conflicts, landlord, tenant relationship, money lender, you know, and <coughs> and, 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 and borrowers in interest rates, you know, interlocking relationship in terms of labor product market. And they realize you are also Marxist, but a, a person of harmony, not in terms of using gun. And, um, but they use gun, finally, so we didn't use. Uh, community groups are formed to generate demand, resource, and improvement. They, community groups demand these uh, projects, but they also implement it. The money goes to their account and they implement the project. Yeah, local capacity in and through training, skill transfer, exposure. We also do increasing exposure visits. We might have one good, you know, one or two good projects, we take them to show and also create more 
more confidence because a lot of times poor say that we are poor because we cannot do anything. But once uh, they see poor fellows working, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a more productive way, they, you know, they, they, they would do the same thing in their own business. Now, another important thing is that integrating institutions in infrastructure, technology, holistic. You know, I'm, I'm talking about one is integration, another is holistic. You have to you know, bring it together. Uh, you cannot talk in terms of institution. A lot of times we just talk in terms of building institution. But if you don't give some resources, you do not have the kind of institution that you require, which can deliver and which can also create some kind of impact on, on the ground so that you can you can you can survive you know, as an institution. Yeah, yeah. Sustainable resource management and poverty is interrelated. I will come to a side later on how they are related and uh, you know, particularly about land, water, and forest, create livelihood opportunities for the poor. Uh, you know, water would, you can use for agriculture. You know. If you have more forest, you have more water, and you can have irrigation system. Similarly, forest can provide opportunity for non-timber forest products, even horticulture inside the forest, which is increasingly being done in the past, and uh, as, as a resource. Uh, yeah, forest generated water, uh, which provides irrigation, water supply, energy, fuel, wood, and fodder. Yeah, the other part which is very important, I remember I, I put this sentence later on, you know, contribution of pe poor people to manage their community forest and provisional environment so need to be recognized and compensated. Yeah, I was in one of the meetings in, in, in Sikkim. You know, we are also part of a network called World Mountain People's Association. The job is lobbying for mountains. And there were 50 farmers from Nepal who went and from India. We had, I think, 300. And one of the farmers from Gorkha, a remote district, gave an eloquent speech. And the summary was, he said, why should we protect our forest for the tourists to come to see our wildlife and wild people in What do you think? in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education, in terms of health. So there I'm talking in terms of, you know, whatever service they're providing in terms of biodiversity, conservation, flood protection, carbon sequestration, need to be quantified and, and these communities need to be compensated for that so that they do not become a museum piece for people to come and see in their traditional places that these are wonderful uh, tribal people, you see, and don't get any, any benefit out of this. Yeah, these are the capacity building training and the providing veterinary services. Yeah, this is the one, natural resource linkage. In fact, I have also prepared a small proposal, which I, I put in the file uh, for study. You know, we have done a manual for EC mode on this, where we are trying to look um, through a participatory approach, the resource linkage between water, land, and forest. Water, you know, I'm giving here. Yeah in terms of you can, which I, I told already this, you can go for irrigation, you can also have water supply, you can also have microhydro. We have done the same system where we combine irrigation, water supply and microhydro together. And if you combine the three, wherever you have possibility, your affordability also becomes more, sustainable because you can re generate revenue not only from the forest but also from water. Because there is a user fee on irrigation, water supply, and hydro. And of course, water would increase uh, the idle productivity even because you can don't you have two or three crops you know, and diversify. So, this is a model where we are talking about the, uh, what kind of impact it would uh, really provide and also provide. If you are interested, we have, we have explained everything in that. In that that small paper in terms of future strategy, in terms of research. And this would be a, we call a natural grant. It looks very complicated. Even for me, it's very complicated, you know. But it shows the relationship in terms of the resources and uh, how do you quantify uh, on, a, uh, on a numerical numbers, you know, 0 to 10, uh, in, in terms of use and all this. We have explained there. And, uh, this is the area that, that I think we need to go because we are always talking in terms of protecting forest, 
but we never talk in terms of uh, impact that is given in, in, in terms of generating water and other, other impacts. In yeah, replication of issues in the model. Uh, you know, a lot of times we enjoy become very romantic, you know. We say, I have done one, you know, 10,000, I'll say 1 million, you know. But there are millions of poor left, you see. And as I, I remember, I think this, you know, vice chair of Right Life Youth Foundation said eloquently this morning that we might be dead and nothing is going to happen. You, know, you guys are young and you have to take over. You know, that is the reason I am really excited and appreciate your presence because when I got the invitation, I said, I'm going to talk to PhD students how I'm going to talk. You know, I'm a doer, I'm not a researcher, you know. Why should I go? And then yesterday, you know, I had 40 Nepalese students, you know, a lot of PhD, masters, and I am a and I talked with them. I said, you have a lot of work in Nepal, why don't you come? They were ready. They said, we'll go and talk and, and do our network and talk to you. So what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize to you is that we need to build up a network, but you also need to have practice and theory to put together, you see. The reason I'm telling you, I was doing more practice, but no theory. But I got the opportunity in, nine, in 2000, I think 2000, yeah. There was a meeting of, organized by World Bank where a lot of secretaries came. And I said, government is the worst service provider in Nepal. And communities are the best, you know, my own experience is. And this World Bank said, why don't you lead a team? We'll give you the money and then you do a study, you know, they call institutional options study, where you have a process measurement and impact, you know, impact in terms of cost, uh, cost effectiveness, impact in income, impact in employment, you know, but uh, cost comparison and also process in terms of how do they participate? Uh, do they participate from planning to monitoring implementation in the community, you know? How do they do it and implement? And it took almost six months for us to develop the model you know, in terms of measurement and all this. World Bank also came in. It turned out to be, after we did the study, called Tarai Option Study, World Bank project was the worst. $70 million irrigation project gone down the drain. And we had a lot of abandoned projects, you know, two million dollars. So I, we wrote, we put up a box, World Bank project gone, the wind, you know, the guy was angry with me. He said, I gave you the money for consultancy. Why do you write like that? I said, I'm not a consulting firm. I'm an NGO. So I, you know, if you don't allow me, you know, I, I cannot stop. So we have 300 copies of this report printed. Then I printed 1,500 copies with four foundation money and circulated widely. The next one, I went to IFA. And they gave me $75,000 to do the other stuff. And we also made videos, brought secretary. Last year we had a meeting in, in Kathmandu, where in the presence of Prime Minister, I said, I have been to the field, communities are the best and government is the worst. And he appreciated it. He said, yes. He's also a chairman of a poverty fund, which I'm also a board member. So these two study findings, concluded that communities are, are the best, you know, in terms of delivery, and we need community-driven approach. And now we have been able to persuade the government to get grant funding for the World Bank to set up a poverty alleviation fund, uh, which is with the initial funding of $15 million. Spread over a period of I think, six years, uh, we could implement uh, uh, 140 million dollars. Now 70 million, 75 million dollars is approved by the bank. And first time bank really went to the community directly, setting up a structure which has got NGO and government participating. And that fund is now covering uh, almost 500,000 households. We have covered around maybe 200,000, but they have covered 500,000. You know. And we also use that fund to, to channel to the community. So what I'm saying that surplus not only need to do does work itself, but also uses local in your community organizing corporate and also links with others to expand the sort of coverage and also create the impact. You know, without networking you cannot even survive, they will kill you. 
they will support and next day if you don't go by their agenda, you are gone. So you have to create yourself to survive in also living life. So these are numbers. Some of the numbers, you know, in terms of water supply, in terms of the road, in terms of food rail, in terms of schools, you know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I need to explain. Micro hydro, cooking stove, forestry. But now the problem is micro hydro. We have done 23, but Nepal has done almost 1200. In terms of number, because there are a lot of other organizations have been a lot of micro hydro. Uh, like somebody was talking about biogas. We have about 250,000 biogas built by through government support, you know, subsidy, and, uh, and so This is one of the words of the system. Uh, and this is interesting. You see, as you go on, you have to also make taps in child friendly. <laughs> so you have to put up two taps, you know. This is also learning. You know. So you have two taps, you know. Otherwise, you say, why are you working one? You know, child cannot have water without the help of the mother, so you need it. So you have to also do some kind of technology improvement as you <laughs> move along. These are interesting pictures. Uh, this is one of the canals, which is I think 1.4 kilometer canal in the mountain for irrigation and also for producing electricity, which you will see later on. This is one of the, you know, we talk a lot in terms of conserving water. Uh, in the remote mountains, we have to take uh, cement by plane. And cement is almost uh, 10 times more expensive if you take by plane. So now we're increasingly using plastic as a reinforcing material to store water. And we have done around 1,000 units in, of these uh, water harvesting tanks. And uh, through it, we use sprinklers because through gravity, you don't need energy to do sprinklers. In. Which is, which is, we, we provide them some food and some plastic and, you know, they will, they will build the system. Now these are uh, drip irrigation system, uh, which is inside the uh, uh, greenhouse. This is a green road. You know, a lot of times, in our mountains, they will bulldoze us. You give money to the local body, they will hire a bulldozer and bulldoze everything. Uh, we are encouraging more in terms of labor intensive, uh, slow moving kind of road building, using food as instrument. To, to improve access. Uh, this is also another greenhouse. Uh, this is also we do the drip. You, you see very clearly. You, you put water inside and then it goes. It's a low cost uh, kind of drip, drip system. Uh, this is the micro hydro. You know, you saw the canal, and this is a drop. It, it, it generates about 100 kilowatt electricity, uh, benefiting 7,000 population uh, in a small small village. Now, this is a community forestry, but it's not a good one, because this is basically in the west where we have water scarcity, so you don't see very good growth. Now, this is a biogas stove. You know. ah, I, mean, I think I'm, I'm close to clo in a closing. I say poverty reduction requires holistic approach. Sopros has demonstrated the worst forms of poverty can be eradicated. Following the holistic approach within time, uh, limited time span, in five years you can bring a big change. And that's what we have come across. If you put, you know, all the components together. Uh, institutions need to have faith in the ingenuity and capital poor. I mean, he, he devoted. You have to trust the poor, not you giving the advice, but they giving the advice. And that is the mission. Otherwise, we might be prescribing something which is not useful to them. Now, support structure needs to be sensitive and poor investment, pro poor investment policy required for poverty. This is very important. You know, you know, traditional support structures like government may not support the poverty. So, if, even government need to create some kind of flexible structure, like the fund that I say poverty fund, to to support the program. You know. And pro 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 poor investment policy is a lot of times if you support infrastructure. You don't have proof for policy. Now we have a smart subsidy policy. Like initially we had 50% subsidy on micro hydro. If you go to the Middle West and Far West, now they give 80% subsidy because affordability is not there. So there also we did a study and we recommended for a smart subsidy and 
the vaccine. Yeah, I've said already that the required for this chemical. Innovations are important, both in terms of institution and also in terms of technology. So you need a special kind of fund for doing a lot of innovation in terms of technology and processes and documentation so that you this could be documented and multiplied. Yeah, natural resources, I already said. Advocacy, he is quite important. You know, media is quite powerful. We are small. And I will tell you a closing story. He said, I was talking to a government servant. I recently went to a village. He told me that all your programs are useless. This is a border area where we still have, you know, a lot of you know, problems with the insurgency. But I had gone to the area with my camera, video camera, and all these things. pictures. He tells me nothing happens. I said, you don't go. And he said, no, I have a camera. I take this. I said, you might be taking a good picture and bad picture of me. So how do we tackle that? I said, now on, I am going to train boys and girls from village. Give them camera. They make their own story. And I will train them how to put in the Facebook and also link with the media so that we have neutral media created with the people themselves, you know. And uh, that I have been advocating in terms of ensuring uh, transparency, accountability. Yeah, this, this is the closing one. Uh, we did the study in 2000, 2001. I think we need to do now one more so that we we capture the changes that have happened in terms of institutional pluralism, you know, in terms of community taking more 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 role and quantify and, and put put to the world that things are different and could be different. So that we don't again go into a centralized system of delivery which is not so effective. Thank you. I don't know how much Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening um, discussion. Or so, also, so are there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, are I'm there here. questions popping up to your mind? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the but the community in your place seems to me that is very close. It's yeah, but yeah, very it's very not, close. Yeah, it's not. So, what do you think about the role of market and market actors yeah. to the success of community activities? Yeah. Well, uh, you are right. Uh, you are right. In uh, we have also a lot of differences in in particularly in in sort of tribal area, indigenous population. You have more cohesiveness. And cohesiveness also comes in terms of the, the activity that they have carried. If the community has carried a lot of activity in terms of building schools or managing water supply in traditional system, what we call the social capital is high. And where income levels are more equal, it's easier to handle. But you have also a lot of areas where contradiction. You have landlord, you have tenant, there you have a lot of problems. You know, I mean it's not a a very you know easy cake you can eat and mobilize. You know. There you have to mobilize the poor separately, then the rich, and then you have a lot of exploitative relationships between rich and poor. It's difficult. But what we have in this in the scene, even in those areas, that one could mobilize the poor separately, particularly for income generation, and uh, also bring rich in terms of building infrastructure that way. But you are quite right in terms of Market is important. The market would, you know, uh, profitable market, not in terms of, you know, uh, uh, like we are talking more in terms of off-season vegetables in the mountain. Where compared to traditional vegetables, if you grow vegetables during monsoon in the high mountain, you get almost ten times more income, and that is where the whole role of technology uh, comes in. You know, now increasingly more realizing in terms of organic, you know, because. Or when consumers are not prepared to eat pesticides, you know. I mean, you are virtually eating pesticides instead of vegetables, you know. Because you know, there is a lot of awareness of media. So, yes, it is important. But equally important is, is the nutrition in our case. And there is a lot of conflict, you know. I was uh, in a strategy meeting with this bad boys and girls. And all, we always focus on market. I said, now, when you talk in terms of household nutrition, you are talking in terms of variety of vegetables, meat, you know, because you, you don't want to eat only <coughs> salad, you know, yeah. or tomato, you know. So, there you have to keep a balance in the market and also in the food everything. 
at a household level, which we are trying to, 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 to you know, balance between the two. Mm -hmm. Some more questions, please? Or everybody's tired? Yeah. <laughs> want to go out in, in the beer garden or? <laughs> Maybe you're speculating. Yeah, he's really he's trying to bribe us. Huh? <laughs> well, I mean, we have one and a half days more yeah. to, uh, to yeah, discuss yeah. issues yeah. of that, and uh, I think it was pretty uh, uh, visible yeah. that the projects of the laureates and the ideas of the laureates are covering so many different topics that each of your PhD students are, you know, only focusing on on one of these topics, maybe only on uh, one particular aspect of poverty, for example, or one tiny part of biodiversity conservation, for example. So with this opening today, we had a very broad opening, but I think it was very visible that we could see how different complex um, issues are interrelated, from biodiversity to, to different poverty to the question, what is development? When was the idea of development uh, invented? And what, how should we work with this idea, or should we abandon our, or change our name, for example? We had this discussion, or we still have this discussion, for example, here at SEF, yeah, which is a development research institute, so even the name uh, calls for that. And so how far should we, or can we go to a post-development idea, or so a question like this? I mean, but we will have tomorrow uh, a, a day which is more based on the input of the PhD students and I'm very happy because there are so many different and very interesting topics from all over the world. So it's like really, uh, you know, really reading science or, uh, you know, you have so many different uh, topics and I think you are all experts in your topics, I don't, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So you, we read your proposals and we read your CV and etc. So I think you can are really the experts in this group on your topic. So tomorrow morning we will start at nine o'clock here. We have three rooms. One is here. One is seminar room uh, three thousand three hundred. No, uh, thirty thirty two. And one is seminar room thirty zero four. Does everybody has it? The program. Okay. So all this, this information about the dates and the names is, is in the program. But I will just, just give a very brief overview. So tomorrow morning we will meet in the, in the working groups and your names are shown here in which, to which working group you belong. So we have three working groups. Uh, one is on uh, local government, community uh, rights and participation, which today already we, we saw the importance of that. The other is agriculture and food production, also was very important, highlighted here. And the next one is questions of, of payments, of markets, so how can, can different strategies or instruments of, of markets or payments uh, work towards our public goals. So these are the three different clusters, thematic clusters, so to say. And uh, we try to divide this large, very uh, heterogeneous group into the clusters. That was very difficult, as you can imagine, but I think you are uh, interdisciplinary team workers, we hope at least, so for you it shouldn't be a problem to work in your cluster. And uh, you can see here that uh, you have uh, around 20 minutes for your kind of talk, but please be prepared to have not more than 10 minutes of, of presentation and then discussion. This is very important. So please don't arrive tomorrow morning with a half hour, an hour, or 40 minutes as we have today. <laughs> well, no, only allowed to talk 40 minutes if you have 40 years of work experience. <laughs> so this is the most important to be short, and the real experts can be short if they want. If they don't want, they can also be long. No problem. But this is very important, honestly, to be short and precise tomorrow. And don't try to include everything you worked ever on or, or your theoretical framework of your PhD. This is very important for your, uh, I don't know, um, professor at home or your supervisor, etc. But maybe not here in the presence. Okay, that, this is the tomorrow morning and in the afternoon, within these working groups, uh, we would like you to form even smaller working groups, like three people hopefully from three different countries, three different topics, three different disciplines, working together and trying to identify or to answer questions 
that are uh, listed here on page 4. And these questions are very broadly to identify and characterize innovative approaches um, and instruments that have been discussed in the working groups before. Then um, categorize the key challenges for the implementation, so think one step beyond. Then define the possible solutions, either solutions that are already being implemented or that are very likely to be uh, to, to work on the ground. And D, to argue for concrete um, actions. And today we heard a lot about concrete actions, but we also heard about how complex this can be. And tomorrow in the afternoon, you in very small groups can think about what could be an action for a problem that, that you have uh, identified in the morning. So this was it's the, the general framework. Are there questions related to this? So the morning are the presentations, the afternoon are the small group discussions. And in the late afternoon, starting from 5 o'clock, if you are still fresh then, um, you can start preparing kind of output papers that you read here. So at the, at the next day, so on the, on the Wednesday, the last day, we want you in the working groups to have a kind of output papers. What did you discuss? What were the key challenges? And what might be possible solutions? And please don't try to write the whole night or etc. But even here, the smaller the better. Yeah? And be just precise and concrete on the topic. Problems, challenges, and solutions. So I think this is a kind of uh, idea to, to bring you in a kind of discussion on a, on a, on a very small piece. Not only the front discussion here with one guy telling to the others for one hour what he has worked for. So we want you to think about uh, uh, problems and problem, complete solutions. Okay? Any questions or no? Otherwise, uh, uh, we will go back to GSI. Yes. And yeah, so see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.